Assalamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. A'udhu billahi min ash-shaytan ar-rajim. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Wa salatu wa salamu ala ashraf al-khalqi ajma'een. Sayyidina wa habibi qulubina abil qasim al-Mustafa Muhammad. Allahumma salam. وعلى آله بيته الطيبين الطاهرين المعصومين. Dear brothers and sisters, once again, السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته. Continuing in our discussion with سورة نوح chapter seventy one tonight, إن شاء الله, we will focus on verses twenty one to twenty five. And in this section of Surah Nuh, we find that Nuh continues speaking to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and telling him that after an extended and prolonged period of teaching and encouraging his community members, that many of them continue to reject his message. They rejected the message of Prophet Nuh alayhi salam and they insisted on their rejection of the message. And so in verse number 21, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, قَالَ نُوحٌ رَبِّ إِنَّهُمْ عَصَوْنِي وَاتَّبَعُوا مَنْ لَمْ يَزِدْهُ مَالُهُ وَوَلَدُهُ إِلَّا خَسَارًا Nuh told Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he was complaining to God, he said, my Lord, they disobeyed me and followed those whose wealth and children increased them in naught but loss. That after hundreds of years, I mentioned several nights ago, that the Quran tells us that Nuh salam remained with his community for 950 years. 950 years teaching his community. And after several hundred years, Nuh, after trying every kind of tactic, every, every kind of way to teach and to guide his people and encourage them to turn to Allah, we mentioned previous verses that Nuh told God that he would teach them day and night in public and private. He tried all means and all ways, yet they still rejected his message. And so he tells Allah, he says, Oh my Lord, they disobeyed me. After everything that I did, the community still disobeyed me. They rejected my message. And instead, they decided to obey and to listen to those whose wealth, who had wealth and who had prestige. And I mentioned, I, I believe, last night or the night before, that one of the excuses that some members of his community, especially the, the disbelievers, the unbelievers, one of the excuses that they gave, they said, Nuh, the people who are following you, these people are from the lowly classes. They don't have money, they don't have family, they don't have fame. You know, they are, you know, sort of, they're uneducated. So there's no value, there's no benefit in us following you because your followers essentially are, you know, from the low classes. And this verse here, emphasizes that the leaders of the disbelievers, they were in fact, many of them were those who were wealthy, those who were sort of famous in society, those who had positions of strength in society. And so they are, were the leaders of the unbelievers who rejected the message of Prophet Nuh. And they also encouraged others to reject the message of Prophet Nuh. And some traditions, they tell us that these people, the leaders of the unbelievers, were in fact the descendants of Qabil, Cain, the son of Adam. The Quran tells us that Qabil killed Habil, killed his own brother, that some of his descendants would go on to reject the message of Prophet Nuh alayhi salam. And they were sort of the community leaders who had wealth and family and prestige. And what this tells us in this, there's a lesson, brothers and sisters. And that is that if wealth and fame 
and authority and leadership, if this does not allow an individual or a community to turn towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and to gain, then wealth and money and fame and all of this is not a blessing. Sometimes it could be a blessing. Wealth could be a blessing when it's used for good purposes, when it's used in order to help others, when it's used in order to further the cause of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or the community. It could be a blessing. Fame could be a blessing when it helps to guide people, when it helps to bring people to the right path. And the same goes with any other sort of you know, fame, whether it's, it's, it's a leadership position, whether you, know, you have a company, whatever it may be. It is a blessing when it's used for good purposes, for beneficial purposes. Otherwise, in fact, it's a big responsibility. Because we know that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will ask each and every one of us. We are all held accountable before Allah on the day of judgment. And we are asked about those things that we had. The blessings that we were given. The wealth that we were given. The family, the positions, the fame, whatever it may be. We are asked, what did we do with it? How did we employ it? Was it used for good means? Was it used to encourage people towards truth and justice and kindness and generosity and helping? Or God forbid, was it used for evil means or immoral means? So here this verse tells us that these community members, they had money, they had fame, they had authority, they had power, they had family. But they used this, instead of using it for good purposes, they used it for evil purposes. To discourage people from turning towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then in verse 22, Allah says, وَمَكَرُوا مَكْرًا كُبَّارًا And they devised a mighty plot. The unbelievers, not only did they reject the message of Nuh alayhi salam, but they also employed various tactics and ploys or plots in order to deviate the community, the rest of the community from the truth and from listening to the message of Prophet Nuh alayhi salam. And some traditions, they tell us that before the time of Prophet Nuh, there were no communities that engaged in idol worship. That idol worship as sort of a widespread phenomenon occurred only during the time of Prophet Nuh alayhi salam. And that these traditions, they tell us that the unbelievers during that time, one of their major tactics was to encourage people towards idol worship, worshiping idols. This was one of the many plots and one of the many tactics that they used during that time to deviate people from the path of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And verse number 23 tells us, gives us details about specifically this aspect, that of idol worship. In verse 23, Allah says, وَقَالُوا لَا تَذَرُنَّ آلِهَتَكُمْ The leaders of the unbelievers, they would encourage the community members, they told them, and do, they, they said to them, do not leave your gods. Do not abandon your gods. You have these gods, these idols that you worship, don't abandon them. Because if you listen to Nuh, then you're going to essentially be abandoning these idols. وَقَالُوا لَا تَذَرُنَّ آلِهَتَكُمْ وَلَا تَذَرُنَّ وَدًّا وَلَا سُوَاعًا وَلَا يَغُوثَ وَيَعُوقَ وَنَسْرًا Do not abandon or do not leave your gods and do not leave wad or suwa or yaguth or ya'uq or nas. These are five names that they employed. They said do not leave these five names. Now, the exegetes, the interpreters of the Qur'an, they've given various opinions as to what these names or who these names refer to. Who do they refer to? Wad, Suwa' Yaghuth, Ya'uq, and nas Who do they refer to? Some have suggested that these names refer to five pious and righteous individuals in the community at the time 
who were very well known. They were well known for their piety. But some people, after their death, after the death of these five individuals, some people ended up creating idols or statues of them, statues of them, so that the community can remember them, so that their memory will remain, and that people can look up to them and revere them because of their position. And that slowly, after generation and generation, some of the community members, they forgot who these individuals actually were, or who these statues referred to, and the purpose that they were made for, but instead they began to worship these idols. So this is one opinion that's given, that these were five righteous individuals. Another opinion says that these were five of the progeny, it's similar to this opinion, five of the sons or the progeny of Adam السلام, who were also unique, they were pious, they were well known, and the same story goes that you know there were idols or statues that were created in order to continue the memory of these uh, descendants of Adam السلام, and after a while these statues began to be worshipped. And the third opinion says that no, this does not refer to righteous individuals or you know progeny or descendants of Adam, but these were in fact the names of five idols that had been erected and created in order for the community to worship these idols. And so the leaders of the community, they, tell, they told the people, they said, do not leave your idols, do not abandon your idols, and especially these five idols. This tells us that these five idols were major idols in that tradition. And historians, they tell us that these idols, either they themselves, or their names, not the idols themselves, but their names, they remained from the time of Prophet Nuh all the way until the pre-Islamic era, the time of Jahiliyyah, Asr al-Jahiliyyah. And that the, the pre-Islamic Arabs, they considered these idols to be amongst, amongst um, some of the idols that they worship. And that each of the major tribes and clans of Arabia they sort of had their own patron idol. One of these idols represented a specific clan. Five major idols represented five major clans or tribes. And other historians, they tell us that each one of these idols represented a specific figure. For example, we're told by Al-Waqidi, a very well-known uh, historian, classical historian, he says that Wad, the first of these, Wad uh, was a representation of a male, was made in the figure of a male. Suwa was made in the figure of a female. Yaghuth was created with the figure of a lion. And Ya'uq was created in the figure of a horse. And Nasr was created in the figure of an eagle that each one of these idols represented a specific figure, and that these idols, they were placed in different places around the Kaaba. These, in addition to the idols that the Arabs themselves, they had created and they had made. Some of the major idols during that time before Islam, some of the major idols are known as Hubal. Hubal was the largest and the biggest idol of the Arabs. It was the, the biggest idol, Hubal. And it was placed inside the Kaaba. The Kaaba, of course, you know from the time of Prophet Ibrahim after it was uh, uh, built, it continued and it was considered a sacred place even for the idol worshippers, the pre Islamic Arabs, the pagans. And so they used the Kaaba and they would actually put their idols inside the Kaaba, around the Kaaba, on top of the Kaaba itself. So Hubal being the greatest idol was in fact placed inside in the heart of the Kaaba. Other idols such as Asaf was one which would face the black stone. So the corner that has the black stone of the Kaaba, a specific idol was placed facing that corner. 
another corner faced, uh, another idol faced the southern or what is known as the Yamani corner, the southern corner. And this uh, was known as Na'ila, the name of this idol. And then of course, there were other famous idols that the Qur'an refers to also, Al-Lat, Al-Uzza. These were major idols that the Arabs worshipped. And historians and scholars tell us that all in all, there were 360 idols altogether. There were 360 idols that the Arabs used to worship before Islam. And these idols were all placed inside and around and on top of the Kaaba. And of course, history tells us that when the Holy Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam, Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa alihi that when he entered into Mecca, he destroyed these idols with the aid of Amir al-Mu'mineen Ali ibn Abi Talib alayhi salam, the traditions, they tell us that the Prophet, peace be upon him and his family, he commanded Amir al-Mu'mineen to stand on his shoulders and to strike the idols. He would strike the idols until all of the idols were destroyed on top of the Kaaba, around the Kaaba. The idols were destroyed. When the Holy Prophet, peace be upon him and his family, began to proclaim worship of the one true God. So this, these verses tell us a little bit about the history of this practice of idol worship and some of the major idols that were instituted and, uh, and worshipped during the time of Prophet Nuh and would continue this practice all the way until the advent of Islam. And then in verse number 24, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us, وَقَدْ أَضَلُّوا كَثِيرًا وَلَا تَزِدِ الظَّالِمِينَ إِلَّا ضَلَالًا Nuh alayhi salam says, Many indeed have they led astray. He's referring to the idols and to the unbelievers, saying the unbelievers, not only did they lead themselves astray, not only did they reject themselves, but they also led others astray. And they led countless generations. And I mentioned this several nights ago, that some of the unbelievers, not only would they reject themselves, but they would also bring their children and they would point to Prophet Nuh and they would say, don't listen to this man. And so they taught them from a very early age to reject the message of Prophet Nuh and to reject obedience and worship to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and in fact toward, turn towards these idols. So Nuh is turning to God and he's saying, oh my Lord, these unbelievers, they have... Uh, deviated from the truth and they have also misguided lots and lots of people. Lots of people have been misguided at their hands. And then he makes a prayer, he prays to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to deprive these people of God's mercy and God's guidance. وَلَا تَزِدِ الظَّالِمِينَ إِلَّا ضلالة. Prophet Nuh alayhi salam he prays to Allah. He tells him, Oh my Lord, these people have caused a lot of chaos, a lot of trouble. Because it's one thing sometimes for us to do something wrong on a personal and individual level. It's between me and God. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala holds me accountable as an individual. But it's another thing when not only do I do something wrong, but I also encourage others and I also contribute to wrongdoing of others as well. When I misguide others. When I cause others to turn away from the truth and to commit evil. It's another thing. Not only will I be held accountable for my own mistake, but I will also be held accountable for others. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala holds me accountable many folds. And the same goes for goodness. It's one thing for me to do good, to be sincere, to be pious, to be observant. And it's another thing in terms of reward and value with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for me to encourage others. And if others are encouraged and others are observant because of your efforts, then you not only receive rewards for your own efforts, but also for the goodness of others. This is why we are encouraged constantly to look out for others, to try to help others 
to try to allow others, push them to, to becoming better people. Not only is their reward for us as individuals, but also reward, greater reward, on behalf of those who do good. And this is why the Holy Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam, Allahumma salli ala Muhammadin wa ali Muhammad. That was um, definitely a post iftar salawat. Sallu ala Muhammadin wa ali Muhammad. This is why the Prophet tells Amir al Mu'mineen, he says, Ya Ali, la an yahdi Allahu bika rajulan wahidan khayrun laka mimma tala'at alayhi shams. O oh Ali, if God were to guide on your hands based on your actions, your efforts, God were to guide one person, this would be greater for you, more valuable for you than having possession over everything that the sun shines upon. Imagine having possession of the entire universe or at least a large portion or galaxy, right? The sun shines upon a large expanse of the universe. Having possession of this, being the owner of this. The Prophet tells Amir al-Mu'mineen, if you do something genuinely with good intention, with sincerity, and someone benefits from that, they are guided because of that, this is greater for you in the eyes of Allah than owning everything that the sun shines upon. Because that person will then teach someone else and so on and so forth, and you will have been the origin of that goodness. And the same, God forbid, goes for evil. And this is why we have to be extra cautious. So here, Prophet Nuh alayhi salam, he says, My Lord, these people misguided generations and generations. They deviated in abundance, in great you know, quantity. And so he prays to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to deprive them of his mercy and guidance. And other verses of the Quran, they tell us that Prophet Nuh Throughout, you know, his whole time with his community, he would constantly be challenged. His community members, they would constantly challenge him. They kept telling him, Nuh, you keep telling us over and over and over again that you have a Lord and that this and that and we should obey and we should worship. And you keep threatening us. If you remember the very first verses of Surah Nuh, Prophet Nuh tells his people what? He tells them that I fear a punishment for you. I am... At I have been sent as a warner to warn you. So the people, they kept telling him, you keep threatening us. You keep warning us, telling us that this punishment will come, befall upon us. But if you're really truthful, then let's go ahead and see this punishment. This so-called punishment that you keep warning us with. Let's go ahead and see it. This Surah Nuh tells us, I'm sorry, Surah Hu chapter 11 tells us, that the kuffar, this is exactly what they told him. They challenged him. They said, Nuh, if you are serious, if you're truthful, then go ahead. Let's see the so-called punishment. And so here we find that it wasn't just a matter of ignorance or mistake. That they insisted and they persisted on their arrogance and their rejection of the truth. And so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us about the punishment of this community. In verse number 25, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, مِمَّا خَطِيئَاتِهِمْ أُغْرِقُوا فَأُدْخِلُوا نَارًا فَلَمْ يَجِدُوا لَهُمْ مِن دُونِ اللَّهِ أَنصَارًا And it was because of their iniquities and their wrong doing that they were drowned, then made to enter a fire, and then they found no helpers for themselves apart from God. We are told of the major punishment that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala brought down upon the evildoers, the community of Prophet Nuh, of course the major flood that took all of them away. Inshallah we will continue with Surah Nuh tomorrow night and most likely tomorrow night inshallah we will complete uh, Surah Nuh, we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to accept our prayers and our supplications, our fasting and the little that we have to offer during these holy days and nights. We pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to forgive our sins and our shortcomings 
and our mistakes. We pray that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guides us to the truth, allows us to be agents of positive change in our lives and in the lives of others. We pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to bestow his peace upon those who are suffering, those who are ill around the world. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to bring relief and comfort to those who are sick, those who are ill. And we pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to bestow his peace upon the souls of those who have passed away. وَإِلَىٰ أَرْوَاحِ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ وَالْمُؤْمِنَاتِ نُهْدِي جَمِيعًا ثَوَابَ سُورَةِ الْفَاتِحَ مَعَ الصَّلَاةِ عَلَىٰ مُحَمَّدٍ وَآلِي مُحَمَّدٍ